Hello and welcome. In this episode, you will discover new tools that will allow you to better manage your time. You will discover how to overcome the analysis paralysis of decision making and how to access your strength to get things done without sabotage or struggle. A couple of announcements. Uh, this is the last episode for the year. It has been another year and we're like almost uh, two weeks away from uh, entering 2023. And another announcement is that we're shutting down this show and we're starting a new show in 2023. And so basically what's happening is uh, that we are uh, basically what's happening is we are renaming the show. Okay. And uh, we have a new brand new name and that's all exciting. And you'll see that in the new year. And uh, that's what we'll do. So let me introduce my guest. Uh, my guest today is Rati Grafine. Welcome, Rati. Oh, my. Hello. It's so good uh, to be here. Great to see you. And I look forward to our conversation. We're I'm talking honored about... to be on the last show of this version of it. Yes. <laughs> and so um, we're talking about mastering the clock and time management and the rest of it today. Let me do the proper introduction to Rati. And we're going to dive into a very interesting conversation. If you know anyone that could benefit from time management and learning a few tips and tricks, share the link uh, with uh, them right now. You could bring them live and or later and make sure to you like and subscribe to the show on whichever channel that is you're watching. Now, for over 25 years, Ruti Grafine has been coaching independent creative professionals such as writers, artists, healers, and entrepreneurs who are scattered and over overwhelmed. As a professionally certified career and ADHD coach, she helps her clients focus so um, they can grab the focus of others, get seen, and make money doing what they love. Her tea has been recognized three times by experts.com, by expertise.com, as one of the 15 best life coaches in New York City. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, son, and their dog. Pokey or Pookie? Pookie, rest in Pookie, died in peace. It died last night, everybody. Just letting you know. I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> and with their dog, Pookie, who is rightly considered a neighborhood celebrity or was considered a neighborhood yes. celebrity. Now he's a neighborhood saint. <laughs> yes. So um, you're in Brooklyn. What's it like out there right now? I love it out here, man. I'm so blessed to live in this area, in this neighborhood. It's freezing, though. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I thought only we, 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 it's like freezing only in Canada. Well, I'm probably we a wuss compared to people who live there. They, they wouldn't think right. this was freezing, I guess. Actually, it, it, it's, it's surprisingly warm up here in Calgary. It's like about zero degrees Celsius. That's warm for us for this time of year. And uh, it's not too bad, actually. You can walk outside. Whew. So, we're talking about time management, and this is a, an interesting topic. Again, gang, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to pop, uh, put them in a, in a comment on whichever channel you're watching. We'll do our best to respond to your questions, and we'll go from there. Now, let's get started. Rati, what is your story? All right. Well, I would say that my story uh, began on a stage in New Haven uh, uh, underneath a couch. I was playing a corpse. I had big army boots on. It was the play was Tom Stoppard's The Real Inspector Hound. And I was probably 15 years old. And Meryl Streep, who was at the Yale School of Drama at the time, was flouncing back and forth across my legs in a gold lama, lame gown. And I was the best corpse. You couldn't tell I was a lot. I didn't breathe for like an hour and 45 minutes. And after the show, I ran over to my dad and I said, so what'd you think? And he said to me, you know, that blonde gal's going to make it. Meaning Meryl Streep. Now, of course, as a 15-year-old, I needed him to say, you were the best corpse. You, I couldn't see you move. How did you do that? But it planted the seed. I made a decision. If I was going to be an actress of any worth or consequence, I had to be Meryl Streep. Mm -hmm. So that belief uh, shot me on this journey of uh, chronic disappointment. 
right? Because uh, oh, I'm back. Yeah, I lost you for a sec. Okay. Well, after many years of disappointment. And oh. I, I, we're back, I hope, for a minute. Yes, yes, uh, I got you. Uh, good, thank you. And I found out that uh, my worth was not related to what I did or didn't do or my success in any way. Fast forward, I left the ashram. I like to say that I was one of the few people ever kicked out of a cult because I was starting to get frustrated. The guru's vision was no longer mine. I wanted to be an actress. Long story short, I was acting out a lot. So I, I ended up back in New York. But what I had learned at the Shram was that company is stronger than will. Company is stronger than will. I couldn't do this alone and started creating support systems around myself based on the work of Barbara Schur, who wrote Wishcraft, and uh, Julia Cameron's The Artist Way. I was helping, I was facil facilitating these groups and people were getting things done. I had a friend who was a, an elementary school teacher in the public school system, and she opened a store on Lexington Avenue. I had another friend who became a DJ. I started a successful yoga practice to support myself and my, I was finally married at that point, and my husband said, you're good, you should start charging for this. Didn't know what this was until I found out it was this thing called coaching, but I'd never been trained. Got some training in it, and it was a lot more fun than cleaning houses or being a cater waiter. And it ticked all the boxes in terms of transferable skills. As an actor, you have to be able to listen. You have to understand story and narrative. And as a playwright, I have to know how to structure a story and help, as a coach, I help other people restructure their stories based on, based on their beliefs. And it turned out that that was the profession this, that was the profession I was supposed to be in, coaching. And that's why I believe all life is cumulative and there's never a wasted moment. Fantastic. Love that story. Um, so what do you do these, these days and who do you serve? Well, uh, as, as you said, I work with creatives, uh, which include app developers, filmmakers, entrepreneurs of all kinds, what they have in common is they feel pulled in 50 directions. I would say 90% of my clients are diagnosed with ADHD, not all of them. Uh, and they're all very anxious about time and, and wasting it and not being where they think they should be by their mm -hmm. age, et cetera. Gang, if, you have, if you're watching and you have any uh, questions or comments about time management or any questions for Ruti, put them in a comment and make sure you're like and subscribe to the show. Love it. So, I mean, working with creatives, it's like hurting cats, basically. Ah, right. right. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, I know most entrepreneurs that I know, hmm. we have ADD. Mm -hmm. But our attention is all over the place. And if it, uh, if there's like ADD or ADHD and you're working with creatives, I, th I think you're working with like a tough crowd. Am I in the wrong track? Ah, well, you know, they people. I think a coach once said that if you want to know your ideal client, look in the mirror. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. <laughs> I have my yeah. own neurodiversity <laughs> issues. So uh, uh, it, it, I never thought I'd want to coach people with ADHD, actually, at one point. And then it, it's all I'm doing. So, And I realized that I get it. But does I that mean that you have ADHD, ADHD as well yourself? Uh, I'll be honest. I wasn't formally diagnosed. I am open about my neurodiversity though. I was diagnosed as bipolar. I have a very close relative who has ADHD and I believe if I were to take the test, I might. But what because coaches aren't diagnostician, diagnosticians, what really matters to me are the traits that people with ADHD have and are very common to a lot of creatives. Right. You know, right. it's just like I like to say that just because there are circus performers on the train, uh, on the airplane, it doesn't mean that the pilot needs to know how to juggle. No. Right. I, I have the skill set. <laughs> right. I, I, I think people with ADD or ADHD are 
are smart people. I don't see it as a as a as a condition or a disease. It's kind of like because I've seen a lot of people who are like they have ADD or ADHD, and when they do or focus on something that they like, they like or love, they are super focused. That's right. That's right. right. That's right. Well, I don't see it as a condition or someone that's like you got to take a pill. It's like oh, I'm 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 fine. <laughs> you it's know, a superpower. And yeah. of course, as with all superpowers, it's got its inherent strengths and weaknesses. I mean, Superman mm -hmm. was Superman, but then don't put him near kryptonite, right? There yeah. are problems with any brain wiring. You know, you could be really cognitive and rational, and then you have no ability to empathize with people. So, yeah, it's just a matter of figuring so out how to drive the car that is your brain. Absolutely. So, Rati, what is your definition of time management? You know, I used to say time management was bull because time marches on no matter what you do. All there really exists is priority management. And actually, I've changed my tune on that uh, because I'm very intrigued by the idea of Einstein time versus... Yeah versus newton time right newton time is linear right uh in a nutshell einstein time we are not the victim of time we are the source of time and uh, you know you know when you're with someone you love or as you said you're working on a project that intrigues you time passes in minutes hours pass in minutes whereas if you're where you don't want to be or you're in physical pain uh, and you're resisting whatever's going on, time is forever. Mm -hmm. And it's so, really, I think time management has to do with shifting your relationship to time and realizing that you are its source. It's why you can get so much done in the last hour of work because your attention is fully there, whereas the rest of the day you might be going, well, how am I going to fill my time? which is not good for ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when 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 you enjoy something time flies and it's yes. probably perspective, a matter of perspective, right? Yeah. Like when you yeah. we're when we're bored out of our minds sitting at home and we're just like, "Oh my god, this is so boring." Time doesn't go very fast, but when we're happy, things like go fast. Oh, and absolutely. It's like the older we get, time seems to go by faster as I well. I wonder if that's cuz we're happier as the older we get. I like I to know. think that's part of it. It's I know the year just went by like real, real cool. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, it's interesting. Um, what is your approach to time management? How do you deal with it? Well, given that I do, I, I think I've always intuitively gone with the idea that we are the source of time. I am not prescriptive uh, with clients. I don't tell them, let's figure out your schedule from nine to 11. You're going to do this. That won't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I help the client dig into their relationship to time uh, and what, uh, where they feel most alive in, 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 and making sure also that they are um, scheduling big uninterrupted chunks of time to do their creative work, uh, right? Um, multitasking, first of all, it's a, I do think it's a myth. We're just task switching and, it's, and you're not taking into account transition time for your brain to transition. Uh, so I really try to convince people, don't expect yourself to work on your novel if you're going to be spending eight hours at your day job, you're not going to come home and get yourself to, to do it. Mm -hmm. right? um, we have to, you know, I take the last week of the month off to work on content. And I just finished a book that's being published by Rutledge uh, in 23. But it was the last week of the month in which I wrote it. I didn't even fucking, I didn't try to turn my mind to it. So that's, the first thing, and if you're not a morning person, don't try to be a morning person. Here's the thing about entrepreneurs. No, it's good that we are, a lot of us have ADHD because we have no business working for anyone else. We have no business pretending we can adhere to someone else's time frame. on one hand. Then there are people with ADHD that imposed structure and the stress of being fired is actually a blessing. 
And then when they retire, they fall apart because they have to figure out their own relationship to time, right? But I start, I, I ask questions that, because I consider the client the expert. I'm not, the consultant comes in, they're the expert. A co with a coach, we are trying to help you access your inner knowing in terms of what will work. Because we have all succeeded at something in the past and that moment in time holds a lot of information about the way we tick and the way we work best. So you talk about the unstun time and I, I read about that definition in Gay Hendricks book, The yeah. Big Leap. Yeah, great book. The great and book. I'll be honest with you, I did not quite get it, mm -hmm. what he described. Like the mm -hmm. beginning of the book, like three quarters of the book, I got it. But the last piece about time, I don't have a good idea. What 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 do you mean by Einstein time and how does it work? Well, I'll tell you. I'm I'm not I don't know that I really could explain it scientifically either. What's your definition? Has, how does it you know, work? What do you me, mean? Einstein time To me Einstein time has to do with taking full responsibility for your time. And so if you if you are feeling bored then you need to put your attention on what you want to be doing not you know and people get distracted with ADHD because pain boredom is painful It can be physically people get headaches from boredom with ADD uh however if you're saying okay I am the source of time and I'm bored What do I want to create? Because mm -hmm. I will die. That's the other thing. When you know time is precious, you're the source of it. And once you're gone, the time is gone. Then you stop saying things to people like, oh, I don't have time to get together. You choose not to get together with that person because it's not right. worth your time. You know, uh, it, it, wherever you are, If, if time is going really slowly, you want to find out what, what, where are you? You're not fully present, right? You're not fully intrigued with your moment. You know, the science behind, uh, you know, the, you know, the theory of relativity, I can't explain that science. I just, you know, I mean, I just know that if a man is falling through space, he feels he weighs nothing on a scale. You know, uh, you know, uh, and and the closer he gets to gravity, that you're going to start to have weight again because of the pull of gravity. But mm -hmm. when you're just falling through space, there is no weight or time, and uh, so that means it's malleable. And mm -hmm. I find that if I don't rush, and I'm just really present and mindful that I have all the time I need to do anything. It's a, you know, I'm sure that, you know, there's a scientific explanation. I can't give it to you. I can give you the woo explanation. I know that rushing slows you down. You, you know, when you rush through things, you miss half of what just happened and you make mistakes. You end up having to backtrack. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you move slowly and consciously through time, mindfully it does feel like you've got all the time in the world so yeah. really it's a kind of it, it, it's a visceral intuitive understanding for me of that of that law i've so i've been experiencing with that calmness yeah. and mindfulness for the yeah. past probably month or so i came across this guy named naval ravikant do you know him It's a familiar name, I think. So I, he's I a he's a Silicon Valley guy. He's like mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, woo woo yeah. guy, pretty successful. And he has a meditation method, but probably not his. But he talked about um, his meditation method. Well, I'll share like real quick. That is, yeah. you sit down for an hour and you do nothing. You let your mind do what it wants to do, and then it just it your mind goes around. And in, in, in about half an hour to 45 minutes, the mind is done doing its crazy things, and it kind of calms down. And I've tried and practiced many different meditation methods, none of which I really fell in love with, but I really fell in love with this one. 
which is like you're i'm not trying to control my mind right. i let my mind do its thing and it get it then it relaxes okay. and it has really affected my daily activities and my results and like the results have been immediate for me wow so, so what um, happens when it's when your mind finally calms down and you're it's sick? this feeling of it, it it's a calm feeling and it's like this 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 rush of energy through my body and sometimes i feel sleepy when i'm like this morning i actually fell asleep mm -hmm. and so at the beginning it's like it's going around and you know um i heard this guy in a vipassana course talking about the mind it's like a monkey that is uh, you know jumping from one branch to the uh, another branch on a tree yes, right. So when it's done doing that, then it just gets to this calm state and it's it's beautiful. And I could feel it throughout the day. And it has helped me with decision making and the rest of it. So and obviously there's like different how, how do you do your do you do meditation? Yeah, it's funny. I did a I did one of the uh, 10 day silent Vipassana meditation retreats. Yeah. Uh, and it was very it's funny. In theory, it's similar to the mindfulness technique I teach in my practice, which is uh, the method developed by Shirzad Shamin, who wrote Positive Intelligence. Mm -hmm. It is really a purely, you're just aware of, you're just tuning into body sensation systematically from head yeah. to toe, from uh, toe to head, just observing without thinking or commenting mm -hmm. on bodily reaction, on, on just your body. Uh, and it's amazing. You don't think you can sit for an hour but you sit for an hour and the prof I healed my eyesight. I actually healed my eyesight after that. I, three days into that retreat, I was f very nearsighted. I, three days into that retreat, I started seeing the definition of the leaves on the trees. And I came back and I got an eye test and I was no longer nearsighted. I don't have to have that on my driver's license anymore. Something very deep shifted. Yeah. And relaxed. And the thing about letting the mind go all over, I don't know that I've had, I'm going to try that. I'm going to give it a try. I think for folks who, who tend to be creative and I don't know, it, it's different for everybody. I, I'm afraid that I would just, I could sit and daydream all day. Yeah. I could, my mind could just go all day and meditation mm -hmm. isn't about stopping your thoughts. It's about not diving into and following them yeah what i really love about this method is like it lets your mind do its thing and then it calms down yeah and when this guy was talking it's it was like music to my ears like oh because mm. i've got a busy mind like my i've got yeah. i think my mind is both creative and analytical right. so it's like racing all day long so the oh. idea of letting my mind god bless me sorry bless you um <laughs> The idea of letting my mind calm down so Ooh. that I can make better decisions and like, get it uh, understanding and a consciousness. Oh, did it, oh. it calm down then? It really did. It was it yeah. that you? He said, "Let your mind go everywhere." But did he also have an instruction not to follow any trend? Yeah, exactly. It's just you're not following. You're not judging. You're not filtering. You just let there it do it its thing. Right. With the, so you're not guiding nothing. You just let your mind and you let yourself be, and then. Some and some days though, like an hour is not enough. Mm -hmm. Some days mm -hmm. it just keeps racing. Which, yeah. um, <sighs> if I didn't have things to do, I don't know. Sometimes, I, so here's another dilemma. Yeah. When I do some days, when I try to do my meditation in the morning, the brain goes, "Oh, we have things to do," and I'm like, mm -hmm. "Dude, shut up! I need to. I need to. I actually need to do this so I can calm down and actually take care of the stuff that I have to do, so I can make better decisions." Yeah. And so, um, yeah, to me, like right now, there's nothing more important than calming my mind down. So I actually can deliver one or two good decisions per day. That's yeah. it. It's so important. I all, I have all my clients at some point or another do some. When I found this peak, this positive intelligence mindfulness, though, it was a godsend because uh, people don't think they can sit and meditate. And especially if you have ADHD and actually it, a lot of people with ADHD are incredibly good meditators. Once they understand what it is, see, you know that, yes, it's, you don't try to control where your mind goes. The key, though, is you're, you're sitting on the banks. Let's say your thoughts are a river. You're not diving into the river. 
you're, you're just sitting on the riverbank and you're letting the river go by. That's the key. And if you sit long enough doing that without diving into the river, then yeah, you're going to find the stillness. But with positive intelligence, it's very interesting. You can do that. Like if you put two fingers together right now and you rub them, I invite everybody listening to do that. Just put your two fingers together. And if you want to close your eyes, it helps focus. And I want you to rub your fingers with such mm -hmm. attention that you can feel the ridges in your yeah. fingertips. Yeah. Just, just do that for a second. Just quiet for a second. And your, your mind may wander. Just bring it back to the ridges in your fingertips. Now, I know I don't want to take up a lot of time because this is a show people listen to, but notice, do you feel like I find it, you're calmed down instant. Once you do mm -hmm. that, you're bringing yourself right into the moment of all that is, is, is your present sensation calms you down right away. You don't have to sit for an hour mm -hmm. to do that. You could, yeah. you could do 10 deep breaths. You could just watch your breathing for two minutes. That's all, that's all it takes. You know, it may, you may need more if you're really hijacked emotionally, of course, but uh, we all have the capacity to seize control of our time by seizing control of our mind, by having, developing the mental fitness and focus through these mindfulness techniques to decide what we want to yeah. do with our time where we're going to put our focus when. Uh, it's a lifelong practice now. It's, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. So we promise people to go over uh, how to overcome analysis, paralysis ah, yeah. with decisions and things that are going around us. What's your yeah. take on that? Analysis, paralysis. Well, here's the, you know what? I, I My coach, Monica Shaw, wonderful wonderful coach. I remember her saying, the secret to decision making is deciding that whatever you decide is right. And what I love about that is the fact is, you know, a decision is just, it's a choice that gives the universe more information. You will get feedback. If you can shift out of the mindset that making mistakes is bad, uh, then you can start to make decisions more quickly. The problem with staying in uh, analysis paralysis is it totally curtails progress. Whereas no matter what choice you make, you're going to stay moving towards your goal. You may have to adjust the trajectory, you know. Uh, however, I think it's more important to make a decision than uh, to make what you think might be the right one. I'm not saying do, do, do your due diligence, don't do your due diligence, but you're never going to have all the information. So, I mean, I heard this wonderful story uh, uh, about um, an army general who was uh, meeting with a bunch of uh, officers about a battle strategy. And the man who wrote this book, and I don't remember what it was, he was like uh, an underling, a low level uh, officer who was like the secretary of that meeting. Everybody was debating. And at the end of an hour, the general slammed his hand on the table and said, okay, we're going to do this. People weren't finished debating. And afterwards, the, the, guy, the officer asked, how did you know? How did you know what to do? And the general said, well, I heard enough. And we will never, we will never have all the information we need. I don't know, but we had to make a decision one way or another. So if you can stop being precious with decisions and make them more like experiments, I'm going to mm -hmm. experiment. I'm just going to choose this and see what happens. Uh, I think you're going to move through that analysis paralysis. I would even put a timer on. Okay, I'm going to give myself, depending on the decision, like if you're in the cookie aisle 
and you're spending 20 minutes deciding between Oreos and a peanut cream thing, you know, just play around. Don't you don't get the 20 minutes. Set a timer for 30 seconds and then just grab a, ba a bag of cookies. We mm. have to train ourselves not to indulge that hyperanalysis, which is really the uh, that's really your amygdala, your your fear center. It's not your cognitive knowing. Go with yeah. your gut. That's where that expression comes from. Absolutely. I was uh, listening to a summary from uh, Nassim Taleb's The Skin in the Game, mm. name of the book. Mm -hmm. and, they, and this guy said, based on what I read here, the best thing we could do, the higher, highest form of acting is to make to risk and make a mistake That's right. that we can learn from. That's like the, I mean, when I heard it, I was like, that is just beautiful. That's the yeah. best thing you could do is to risk something and make a mistake That's so right. you can learn from. Yeah. And so... I think a lot of us are scared of making mistakes, but then if we don't make mistakes, we won't learn things. That is right. I mean, absolutely. Uh, so many careers have begun and ended before they even started mm -hmm. because someone was stuck in their head and uh, yeah. I, I can't get the line on the paper right. So, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, our... You know, if I can't play guitar like Segovia, I'm not going to play guitar. You know, and so many, you know, I mean, for me, one thing I have to say for my younger self is she dove in head first. Mm -hmm. She made a big old mess. Yeah. And if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have learned everything I have. And I'm so grateful for every mistake I've ever made. Yeah. I mean, you, you wouldn't have all the knowledge and experience if no. you didn't. No. Right. No. It's like, but the, the other part is like, I think society and the, maybe the school system oh, yeah. is training us to not make mistakes because people that make mistakes are mistakes are punished. They get lower grades and they get like put down by the school system. They're saying, you know, you're not good enough because you didn't, your grade is not as high. You weren't, you weren't right enough. Yeah, there's and a lot then, of shame. There's a lot of good and bad yeah. around, you know, the scores instead of just curiosity. Mm -hmm. Like, huh, you got that problem wrong. Let's look at that. What what happened? Or, you know, if it's not even a grading system, I think it would be better. Just you got a certain number right, wrong. It doesn't even matter how many questions you got right or wrong. Let's mm -hmm. dig in with that without judgment and see. Why did you get these answers right? What did, well, how did you retain that information, right? Learning to yeah. learn is not taught. Yeah. Interesting. That shaming piece is an important piece. Gang, if you're watching or listening, uh, if you have questions or comments or feedback, put them in a comment and uh, we'll uh, cover it. It's interesting. So we talk about tools that will allow people to better manage their time. What do you have in your toolbox? In my toolbox, which I you know, I do have tools, it's true. I do pull them out. I do make suggestions. I will ask permission. Sometimes that's appropriate if people are, you know, uh, in, in general, uh, my favorite tool uh, for a time management is looking at the day like it's a sandwich. Uh, and again, I credit my coach, Monica Shaw, with this image of the workday sandwich. In other mm -hmm. words, you have the first slice of bread and that's the time of day. She calls it goddess time. You can call it God time. When you are totally nurturing yourself. I get up in the morning and I have a cup of coffee with a piece of dark chocolate. It just makes life worth living. You know, I do something enjoyable. And then I do some gratitudes. I have a little ritual that I do in the morning. Uh, and then when you enter the meat or the uh, filling, that's your work day, right? Some people have a club sandwich. You have that another slice of bread in the middle where you're taking a break. You're, you're uh, resting, a walk around the neighborhood, whatever. And then the top slice of bread is very important, maybe the most important slice. Mm -hmm. because that's when you consciously decide that work is done. And a lot of entrepreneurs don't do that. And then they get burnt out. 
You decide, okay, I'm done. Here's the secret to deciding you're done. You realize that you never are. You will never be done. You will never finish everything. So you stop at a certain time. You plan the next day. This is critical. So many entrepreneurs and creatives flounder because they're wasting their energy making decisions about what they're going to do with their day the morning of. Big mistake. Yeah. You decide the night before what your three priorities the following day are. Mm -hmm. And then you enjoy your darn evening. Mm -hmm. You have your life. And that sets you up for your morning slice of bread beautifully because you don't have to worry about figuring what what you have to do. You wake up, get out of bed, and you already know. Yeah. So I love, love that. that. That's great advice. Every yeah. time I do that, I actually feel better. Oh, yeah. First thing in the morning, because I, I've, I, and I write it down either on my phone or, or on a piece of paper. No, I, I mean, I don't do this every day, but I, mm -hmm. I guess I should be doing it. Uh, but when I do it, things get done and I'm calmer and I cross things off my list. And that's like the greatest feeling when you actually do something and it's done. Absolutely. And it's beautiful. And you know, when you don't do it, you can also look at that. Uh, with curiosity and and it can be valuable because then you real you actually experience why it is that you do do it and then when you get back to the structure you go oh this is much better than skipping it becomes a positive addiction you know that you're not quite right with the world on the days you miss it it's not a should mm -hmm. it, right you just move towards what feels good but, you know, sometimes we're just comfort comfortable in our discomfort, and that's why it can get be difficult to establish a positive habit. Just have to keep... My, my, my definition of consistency is returning. As long as you keep coming back and practicing, when people say, I'll try, that's bull. It's, it, you know, failure is inherent in I'll try. If you practice the workday sandwich, one day you fall off, so what? You're going to practice. Yeah. You're going to get back to it. Yeah. Let me go over this comment here from Adele, and then I'll have some uh, some discuss with you. He okay. says, usually it's a cat and mouse, mouse game for me between time and finances, knowing that afternoon to evening are best time to for work for me. What will you suggest how to organize my day? Mm -hmm. A cat and mouse game. Between around. time and finances between time and finances. You know, without knowing the particulars of the situation, it's a little hard to just give advice. I'd be curious to know what this uh, listener does. Mm -hmm. I think he runs a, he runs a, a, Adele, if you could uh, tell us more about what you do and what, a little, bit a little more details so, yeah. so, so Bertie can, can comment on. Let me go back to the feeling piece. I was listening to uh, a coach, um, high-end high coach who was coaching people like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant and mm -hmm. some high-end um, uh, high-performance athletes. And he was saying that a lot of times to reach that high-performance goal or that place, they were ignoring their heart and their feelings. Just to get, because sometimes the heart, their heart was giving them wrong signals. What's your take on that? Wow. Their heart was giving them wrong signals. Well, I, I wonder, I wonder what he means by well, that. Let, let me give you what I understand from that. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I have to give, do things. And then my heart says, oh, Mustafa, we're tired. We need to take a break right now. Why don't we just go have a cup of coffee and enjoy our afternoon while I have actually things to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the feeling says I'm tired while I actually have to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what he meant by that. I don't, yeah, I don't... Maybe. Uh, I know that, you know, certainly in terms of sports psychology, if somebody is feeling bad because they missed a shot or they're feeling anxious about making the shot, they're sure to miss it. Whereas if they make a mistake in the game and they're able to just move on into the next moment, not hold on to any regret about what just went on and be fully present in the game and just focus not on the throw, but on the destination, 
then uh, th that ups the game, I think, for athletes. Um, and I think if you are feeling too tired to do something, yeah, we do have to under we do have to overcome our feelings sometimes. That's a moment to really, I think, connect with the why. Yeah, I'm really too tired to do this. I just can't. But if I don't, then where I want to be by the end of the day is not going to manifest. And if yeah. that matters enough, you'll move through the fatigue. It's really I, about the why, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm with you 100%. If sometimes when you don't have a good enough or a strong enough why, it's yeah. hard to do the work. But then sometimes it's maybe a matter of find, fighting and ignoring the conditioning that we already have that is not supporting us. Mm -hmm. So so going back to this heart idea and ignoring the feelings, my conditioning says that, oh, I need to take a time off right now and go rest while I actually need to change the way I think, ignore that so that I can go to the next level. Or maybe, now, you, don't. Be maybe you don't, you know, because here's the thing. if you, I'm a big proponent of if you're tired, rest. That's actually- No, 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 that's not what I mean. That's not what yeah. I mean. If you're tired, genuinely tired yes yes but sometimes our mind plays tricks on us and says mustafa we're really tired i could really use a cup of coffee right now to which i should say shut up brain i have work to do what if you're but i'm not really was, tired that's what i mean let me ask what if your brain was a little boy uh -huh. and you, that that brain of yours was your son and your brain was like i, I don't want to I want to lie down. I'm tired. I'm hungry. How would you, would you go shut up? Be quiet. That's not we, how would you parent that child? I would. So if it's genuine. Yes. I would. And I think Gay Hendricks in the book talks about the upper limit where you yes. reach a certain point, you're getting things done. All of a sudden brain, the brain comes up with some nonsense and then takes you away True. from what needs to be. I think that's what this guy meant here. Uh -huh. I could be wrong. So then maybe you would say, little boy, I know you're tired. I know. And we're going to, you're going to be, when it, we're going to, when we do this, we're going to feel so good. And I'm going to give you a treat. You are going to get a reward. If we do this, I promise. And this is why it's important that parents keep their word. You know, you would coax. I know you're tired, but you can do it. You're Superman. You would play, right? You wouldn't shame yourself. Right. Or you would say, you know what, you're capable. You would you would coach yourself. Yeah. And I, I do believe in the upper limit problem. Sometimes, you know, very quickly you feel bad after something goes well or you find the next thing to worry about that. That has, I think he's talking about uh, a need for expanding our capacity for right. joy. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's a little a little different than. Um, just, uh, you know, if and maybe you're tired because of an upper limit problem. It doesn't the why doesn't matter. It's, it, you know, it really is connecting to uh, being kind to yourself and encourage finding whatever it yeah. is that's going to encourage you. Absolutely. Well, so I, I feel bad because we moved past this guy who had a question about. No, no, he just gave us the description. He says he does local marketing and he says, my question is basically yeah. around how to get best use of time with morning. Mornings are not when a, he can find him find himself engaged with work. Right. Well, why does he have to be? Well, first of all, I don't know. Yeah. Does he work at a company? Is he self-employed? He runs a company that does local marketing for other other companies, okay. like a marketing agency. And that that was my immediate response. So, like, you don't have to work in the morning. You could yeah. do it in the evening or afternoon. Why are you? If it's your yeah, yeah. I'm, that's my thing too. When I work yeah. with people, I'm like. When let's keep, you know, this is something a lot of coaches do, not just me. I will have people to keep a time log for, a, for a week or two mm -hmm. and write down, just look over their shoulder every half hour and write down what happened. Absolutely. Where did their time go? Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, don't, and just like you sit and you let your thoughts go wild without trying to stop them, just live your life for two weeks and record you're going to learn so much about your personal rhythms. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that you don't change things. You may notice certain things. Oh, mm -hmm. I have 
uh, bedtime procrastination revenge syndrome. No wonder I can't get out of bed in the morning. I'm streaming videos till 3 a.m., right? Uh, and then you see where the habits need to shift. But you will also find out what your natural rhythm is. Some people are night owls. Some people do their best work at 3 in the morning. Right. You know, uh, it, I think we have to stop making ourselves wrong and just get curious. Absolutely. I don't know. I, if I love you that. I've done that practice um, I had to pr to track yeah. your. That's probably been one of one of the best time management and time tracking tools that I've used. Yeah, and don't assume you know. My time for a don't week. assume you know, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have no clue what you do with your time until you actually do this. Yeah, like you you track your time. What have I done in the past half an hour to an hour? And when you do that for a week, then then here here was here was my experience. I did it, and then I looked at the time, and I'm like, I I don't do that. Mm. And then and then the second response, hell yeah, you do that. <laughs> That's you. We think mm -hmm. that. Oh, I, I was thinking I was so organized and optimized and very effective, so but then the reality was different. I would suggest to do. Uh, you know, the gentleman who wrote in, uh, I would like to prescribe that experiment. Track yes. your time. For the yes. next two weeks, let's see where your energy yeah. is going. And so Adele, the the data. absolutely. So Adele, if you're watching or listening, the suggestion is track your time for um, for two weeks. So, and here's what I would do. I would set a timer for every 30 minutes to an hour to ring. So to remind me to track what I've done in the past half an hour to an hour. And boy, when you do that for two weeks, it's like, it's a massive eye opener. Like the you see the reality of your world and where your time goes, and then you could start optimizing it. It's beautiful. I love and it. Sometimes it's a cure within itself. I just want to add that I've experienced when I've done that, all of a sudden you're really aware of your time. We're oh yeah. Einstein time. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, you're, if you have to track your time, you're very aware about where you put it. Tracking time 100%. just, as an experiment to discover is fine, mm -hmm. but it, it also may end up causing you to use it much more efficiently and, and moderate and in your energy may, you may find your energy changes. Yeah. And when you become more aware of what you actually do, then you can decide whether you want to do it or not. Yes, it's, it's a beautiful exercise. If you're watching or listening, I'll probably start doing it for the next two weeks just to see where I'm at Yeah, and then uh, take it from there. Hmm. Well, so, so far here are a few tools that we talked about and feel free to correct me. Uh, one was meditation to calm your mind down so that you can actually manage your time and become conscious and become aware of what it is that you do. That's right. Two was, um, uh, what was the second one? Right now we just, we just talk about um, tracking your time. And there was a third tool that you, we talked about. Oh, the it, sandwich, workday sandwich. Yes. Is that it? Yes. I think there was another one. There maybe there was a, there's a fourth one that I escaped my mind. But um mm. so those are some of the tools that oh, we talked yeah, about. decision making. Don't don't yeah. writing down, writing decision. down what needs to be done. That was another thing. Like decide right. what, what you need to do for the next day. For the next day, the night before. That's right. Yeah, the night before and in the morning you look at it, what's the priority? Boom, you get it done. Yeah, I would say just choose three things the night before. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, also that gets into your overall goals for the week or the month. If what, if the three things you're, if at least three things aren't moving you forward toward those goals, then you're not spending your time where you actually want it. Yeah. So the, the three Absolutely. goals for the day should pertain to what you're trying to accomplish. Yes. Overall. Yes. So we talked about the zone of genius. What is the zone yeah. of genius? How can we find it and how can we spend more time in there? Did we talk about the zone of genius? I don't know. But let's talk about the zone of genius. Not yet. Yes, the zone of genius. Oh, that is just a bit of that. You hear that a lot in the inspiration economy now. Are you, you know, I here's the zone of genius. If you write down all the things that you need to do to keep your business running, and you eliminate everything that someone else could do. You know, putting together the contracts, doing the payroll, you know, getting the, the money, formatting the newsletters, whatever. And you just boil it down to what only you can do. 
for instance, I'm the only one who can coach my client. Yep. I'm the only one who can show up and do this live stream. You have identified your zone of genius. If you've created a living doing something you love and you find yourself resenting how difficult it is, it's probably because you're not spending the time you need in your zone of genius and yep. delegating the other stuff mm -hmm. uh, is one take I have on it. The stuff you do easily, yep. you know, that could be, you could also say it's the stuff, the stuff that feels like breathing. It's, it's practically natural. You know, yes. Right. That's, that's your zone of genius. I'm not going to spend two hours formatting my newsletter when somebody can do it in 15 minutes or less. Right. Because it's their zone of genius. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so I just recently read the book and again, if you're watching or listening, the big leap by Gay Hendricks is an yeah. absolute read. It's a fun, uh, it's a game changer. So when I read it, I found my zone of genius. One of them is actually what we're doing right now. When I'm, when I do the show, when I do a podcast, when I'm on stage, when I'm speaking and when I'm teaching and managing a room, I'm in my zone of genius. Like it's, mm. I don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. I find it really easy. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. And, you know, another way for me to identify is like things that I'm against doing or being known for that I do it naturally. For example, I never wanted to be known as a speaker. I don't want to become a speaker. Turns out when I'm speaking, I'm in my zone of genius. <laughs> Be now, I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best speaker in the world, but it comes to me naturally, like standing up and talking and managing a room of a thousand people comes natural to me. Then I was like, Oh, I had this big aha moment. My lights yeah. went on. I'm like, yeah. there's something here I should focus on. That's why we actually, that's why I, I pulled the trigger on rebranding the show that I just announced uh, in the beginning today. So if uh, the big leap gang, you got to watch it. You know, you got to read it and not watch it. And he also has a very nice podcast called The Big Leap, uh, Gay Hendricks. I forget his colleague that he does it with. Oh. Uh, but I've been listening to that, too. Not to not to talk about a competing co podcast or anything, but uh, oh, hmm. there's room for everybody. <laughs> Love it. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about your gift. Uh, yeah. And I shared the links here in the comments earlier. What is your gift? Tell us about it. The three keys to your next step in life when you're pulled in 50 yeah, man. directions 50 directions well i'm very happy you're sharing this gift with your audience now because boy isn't it the time of year we're all supposed to be making decisions about 2023 and what the heck we're gonna do right. um this is uh a, the, the three keys it uh, is basically a system of breaking down the information involved in a decision mm -hmm. and identifying what matters most to you. Mm -hmm. And then once, and that's what you make, that's what you base your decision on. Whatever is most important, that's where you're going to put your focus. And once you do that, you can take action. Once you make a decision, you can take action. And if you use this gift and go through the worksheet, you will be doing your internal due diligence. There is no reason once you lay it all out there, what's important to me spiritually, what's important to me in my career, what's important to me in terms of my relationship, you know, the, whatever the big three areas are for you, and you get them all down there. And, you know, you, you identify, for instance, uh, you might be somebody who wants to um, open a health food store, but meanwhile, you're dealing with autoimmune disease and, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to get pregnant. Well, you, you figure out through this process you can do everything, but not first. You can't do everything first. So it's not just decision making, but in the process of making decisions, prioritizing. So yeah. a person like that may put all their effort into a healing regimen for their autoimmune, which of course informs what they want to do professionally, 
right? And then once they're good and healthy, I forget what the other one, they want to have a child, did I say? Was that it? My short-term memory is like shot. But then they can, you know, that when you got, you know, the expression, when you got your health, right? Mm -hmm. Now, another situation could be you have this, um, you want to write the great American novel, but you don't know where your next paycheck is coming from. You may find whether you like it or not, it's not neither or, but first you have to solidify your baseline income. And you, you know, you, that's where you're going to put your focus. You identifies the way, the ways that you can make money so that you're not worried about your income. And then you can focus on your novel. It's really a, a brain purge and clarification that a uh, system that will allow you to really see the decision when you, when your values are aligned, decisions make themselves. You identify what's really important to you, what in, in accordance with your values, and you see it laid out in front of you, you're going to find it really helps to make the decision rather than just rumbling around in the darkness of your own mind. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So again, the link to the gift, the three keys to your next step in life when you're being pulled in 50 directions, the, the link is in the direction and the, in the direction, in the descriptions of the show. And it's in the comments that you can click on and get access to. Now, um, um, uh, Rati, would it be all right if I ask you a couple of personal questions before we wrap up? Sure. I'm all right. So <laughs> what is something new you have tried recently? Something new. I have tried. It could be big or small. Small as a cup big. of coffee, big as going to the moon. Uh, well, I'll go with the first thing that came to mind because, as I said, my dog just died. Uh -huh. And what I've been doing, I would say, in the, with, uh, you know, in the last couple of years is I have been letting, I have been death doula-ing. And that's new. Instead of deciding... Oh, well, everybody says the animal should be put to sleep. I'm just following my heart and, 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 and following the cues of the animal. And, is, and, and, and uh, I have doulaed two deaths. Uh, and, you know, spiritually, you know, my mother, uh, I also doulaed my mother's death. And I, I, you know, we could have said put a needle in her arm because she's not enjoying herself. But the fact is, we don't do that with people. Mm -hmm. And who's to say that an animal wants you to, to put them to sleep? So I, yeah. and I had a very traumatic experience doing that many years ago. So I decided yeah. no matter what, I am going to be courageous and live moment to moment. And death is going to be part of our day-to-day -day life because death is part of life. So I'm so grateful that I had the experience of, doulaing these two little animals deaths recently and uh i recommend it being with your fear that's the experiment being yeah. with your fear uh you know it takes courage and it should it, uh, to me that seems like a, a, a relieving or relieving experience when you actually face your fear you're in the moment and then you're done with it instead of ignoring it and acting like you're just going to bury it and put it away. Now, and that's um, where regrets come from. That's where exactly, regrets yeah, come from. Yeah, yeah. But when you when you just walk door. right into it, heads first. That's it. You have no regrets. Yeah. Give me two of um, two of your favorite books. My favorite. Oh, Man's Search for Meaning, Victor Frankl. Mm -hmm. Yep. And Julia Cameron's Artist Way, the Artist Artist Way. way. Yeah. I, I should I read that Artist Way book. Spurs, witchcraft. That's seminal. Those three books you're set, in my opinion. What was the last one? Uh, Barbara Schur, S-H-E-R. She, she died last year. I consider her the mother of coaching, and she wrote a book called Wishcraft. 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 Not witchcraft, but wishcraft. Love it. I'll put it on my list. Yeah. What, what advice um, or what advice made a big impact in your life or business? Just the one, the biggest. Ah, oh, what advice made the biggest impact in my life or business? Well, what's coming to mind is uh, examine your relationship to money. Examine what money is to you. 
It's not just a form of currency. It symbolizes something. That was very big. My coach, Monica Shaw, really talks about money voices and she works with women and money. And it's true for men and money. You know, Monica money. Monica? But what? Monica, what was the last name? Monica Shaw, S H A H. Uh, money. Get 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 clear about your money, your relationship to money. Mm -hmm. Do you love it? Do you do you dislike rich people? You know, if you have a problem with, you know, you got to look at your relationship to money if you want to have it, and you have to pay attention to it. That very interesting. Business wise, where it was probably business wise, best it best. Love it. Um, Rati, if you had a Facebook or a Google ad where everyone around the world with access to internet could see a message, what would your message be for the people of Earth? Ah, the people of Earth. Oh, I would. I the first thing that comes to mind is rushing slows you down. Rushing slows you down. Any mistake I ever it. made, right? Slow down because. Yeah, think about any mistake made in the heat of rage or whatever, rashly. That was the punchline. That was the that was a mic drop for this show. <laughs> rushing rushing slows, slows you down. down. If at any time, any moment you're trying to rush, you're probably hurting yourself. I agree. And I have a personal story on that. I have multiple personal stories. I so we're almost out of time. Um, uh, Rati, is there anything that you maybe would have wanted to mention real quick that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Oh, well, thank you. You're putting the free gift out there. Um, I guess just keep an eye out for my book, which is uh, coming out uh, in 2023. I'm not exactly sure in about six months called The Five Emotions That Stop Success. And it's going to be published by Rutledge. And I'll give you a teaser. I will tell you what the five emotions are. They are shame, grandiosity, envy, boredom, and fear. And I really mm -hmm. dig into the dynamics of those emotions in the book. Very nice. Well, this was a really inter interesting conversation. That was a value bomb. A lot of good nuggets, tools, and information. If you just joined us, go back and re-listen and re-watch the show. Uh, Rati uh, and I talked about some really good stuff about time management. Thank you, Rati. This was a great show. Um, you shared a lot of nuggets and knowledge and wisdom. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, this is the last show for the year. Uh, next year, we are coming up with a brand new name and a brand new show, which is going to be interesting. I'm excited about and um, take care of yourself, gang. Happy holidays. Uh, happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year's. Whatever it is that you are. Um, celebrating, have fun, take care of yourself, literally take care of yourself and yeah. meditate, <laughs> you know, calm down, use this time to reflect, set the goal, set the plans for the new year. So you know what you're doing and you know your goals and your vision, take care of your family, have fun, and we will see you in the new year. Happy new year, everybody. Happy new year's. Bye Thank now. Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you. Bye-bye.